Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lunch Break Science. I'm Ariel Johnson from the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit that supports human evolution research and shares to discoveries. Today, we take a look at one of the most astonishing scientific discoveries of 2023, is named by National Geographic, chimpanzee menopause. To hear more about the latest discoveries like this one, directly from the scientists involved, start by subscribing to our channel and clicking that notification bell so you don't miss a thing. Also, tell us where you're joining from in the chat or the comments, whether you're watching live or catching the replay, we're excited to know who's here. Today, Dr. Melissa Emery Thompson joins us from New Mexico in the United States, where she is Assistant Vice President for Research and Director of the Comparative Human and Primate Physiology Center at the University of New Mexico. Here we are seeing the uh, lovely building she works in. Um, Melissa co-directs the Kabali Chimpanzee Project in Kabali National Park in Uganda, which studies the Kanyawara Chimpanzee Group. Here we're going to be zooming into the range of the, of the Kanyawara Chimpanzees and seeing a lovely photo of the, some of the chimps and, and the team. Melissa also collaborates with many other primate sites, including the neighboring Ngogo Chimpanzee Project, whose chimp group is central to the chimp menopause research. Let's give Melissa a warm lunch break science welcome. Hi, nice to be here. <laughs> well, we're all excited to have you back on the show and catch up with you. So you are part of this really fascinating study. Uh, well, here, here it is. We have a, a, a image of the um, of the article. Oh, maybe. Oh, there it is. Okay, uh, that revealed that chimpanzees experience menopause. This has received an enormous amount of media attention, as you can see from all of these amazing articles written in top newspapers from around the world. Why do you think the discovery of chimp menopause connects so strongly with people? You know, I, I, I thought this was exciting, but I didn't quite <laughs> anticipate the amount of, um, of press coverage. And, I, you know, I think it goes back to our being really interested in why humans are special. And uh, every time we kind of break that barrier a little between what makes us special and other species, um, it, it does tend to, to receive a lot of attention. So um, I think for the public and for the press, uh, menopause is something that um, is, is really culturally significant for people. It's part of our biology that, that people really feel and experience. And so that uh, probably explains a lot of that interest. And, and for the you know, biologists and anthropologists, um, it's more about being able to have a little more information and, and check some of our assumptions when we're making arguments about how humans evolved. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that the, the bottom line of do chimpanzees have menopause, yes or no, is actually not <laughs> as interesting uh, a question. That's sort of what people have focused on um, in, my, in my talk. I'll get to more why I think this is really exciting. Well, here are some of the remarkable post-reproductive female chimpanzees of Ngogo who are central to the study. Since chimpanzees are our closest living relatives, it's not surprising that we share traits in common, but menopause isn't exclusive to humans and chimpanzees. How common is menopause in the animal world? It depends who you ask. <laughs> so you know, <laughs> it depends how you define it. And, and people from different fields will define menopause somewhat differently. And so you will see papers that are out there that say all kinds of species have menopause and others that, that point to only a few. Um, and so if you, if you think of menopause as um, an event that an individual experiences, um, that essentially an individual outlives their, their fertility, um, you can find in many species extremely old individuals who at, at least are suspected of having undergone menopause, but it's extremely rare in those species. Um, on the other hand, what makes humans really interesting is that we live so much longer uh, past our age of last reproduction. And, and so 
um, that post-reproductive lifespan uh, as a distinct phase of life is what uh, evolutionary biologists are really excited about. Um, and, and you only really see that kind of uh, extensive post-reproductive lifespan in humans and in a few species of toothed whales. And you have short fin pilot whales, narwhals, beluga whales, killer whales, and now chimpanzees. So there is undoubtedly oh, more to the story than meets the eye, and we're excited to dig deeper. But first, we want to thank the Anna Gordon Getty Foundation, Camilla and George Smith, the Joan and Arnold Travis Education Fund, and viewers like you who made this episode possible. If you're watching live, be sure to drop a comment or question in the chat. We love hearing from you. Um, so now let's turn the virtual floor over to Melissa and learn more about this exciting discovery. Thank you, Ariel. Okay. Uh, now we'll get your slides up yeah. and um, there we go. I'll see you on the other side of your talk. I'm very <laughs> excited. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Thank you. It's really nice to be back and, and I'm privileged today uh, to be able to present this research on behalf of a, a large team of collaborators. And that of course includes uh, the, the leaders of the Ingogo Chimpanzee Project, who've been studying this community of chimpanzees in Uganda for the past 28 years. Uh, Brian Wood, who uh, put together the demographic analyses for the paper. And then mine is one of three different labs that analyzed hormonal data for the project um, at various points. So um, to set the stage, the big reason that anthropologists are particularly interested in this issue is that chimpanzees and other great apes are plausible models for the ancestral reproductive pattern before humans evolved extremely long lifespans and features like cooperative breeding that a lot of anthropologists have posed as being critical to the evolution of a post-reproductive lifespan. Um, chimpanzees are also one of the few animals that's available for study that lives anywhere near as long as humans do. They can live past the age of 60 in the wild. Most of the other species that are that live a long time live in the ocean. So chimpanzees are also notable for being one of those species that's uh, best described in the world after, after more than um, six decades of research across various locations in Africa. So when um, Ariel asked about uh, what's interesting about menopause, I noted that I, you know it's not particularly surprising, I guess, that chimpanzees can go through menopause. Um, and this is because the, the process that leads to menopause is something that's shared across all mammals, but we just happen to know a lot more about it in humans. Um, and, and this is because the female germline, uh, all the cells that could eventually become uh, oocytes or egg cells, it's established very early in uh, fetal development. All those cells migrate into the ovary um, and they're essentially held in suspended animation within what we call follicles, which is the, the primordial oocyte surrounded by a bunch, of a, uh, a bunch of cells that will help it grow. And very few of those cells will ever become a mature oocyte. They degenerate over time in a, in a kind of programmed cell death that's called atresia. Um, so um, most of them uh, are, are lost even before a female is born. And in humans, 98% of those follicles are gone by the time a young woman even has her first menstrual cycle. Um, so this, um, this is a process that again is shared across all mammals. So uh, all of them are kind of on their way <laughs> to, to being menopausal should they live long enough for this process to, to play out. So what we expect is that fertility is going to decline with age, but that it will decline at about the same rate as um, aging in the rest of the body. But what happens in humans is um, that this is decoupled. So we see that the uh, reproductive system ages much faster than other systems. Essentially, we stop reproducing even when uh, we're fairly healthy, and that's what's unusual. So if we look across species, uh, other mammals usually follow that expectation that um, a reproductive lifespan and total lifespan are, are the same. And so those are all those green bars on this, uh, this chart. Um, sometimes this isn't perfect. So we see that you have exceptionally old individuals that 
outlive their fertility, but not by much. So you see a few of those bars that have little orange stubs at the end, and those are individuals who happen to live a little bit longer. But there are only five species that have been known to experience prolonged post-reproductive lifespans, which are shown in orange. So we have humans and those four species of toothed whales. So I said that um, chimpanzees have been studied really extensively. So you know, why didn't we already know this? Why, why is it such a big deal to find that they're undergoing menopause? Um, the first answer to this question is just that uh, while chimpanzees can live into their 50s and 60s, in any given population and any given time that they're being studies, studied, there's going to be extremely few of these old individuals around. So it's hard to study this systematically. Um, they also have a really slow reproductive rate to begin with. So um, birth intervals for chimpanzees can be anywhere from two years to more than 10 years. So it's kind of hard to distinguish menopause from the natural variation that chimpanzees experience, particularly as they're aging and, and reproduction is kind of naturally slowing down. Also, while a lot of studies have tried to look at reproductive aging, uh, we've overwhelmingly done so using indirect evidence, usually from observed reproductive events. So birth rates, um, changes in, in cycles, uh, changes in the appearance of sexual swellings as females get older. Sorry, let me find my arrow again. <laughs> there we go. Um, so for example, about 15 years ago, I worked with a bunch of other uh, chimpanzee study sites uh, to compile the reproductive histories that were available. This was for uh, 165 females. Um, and what we found in the figure on the left, uh, you can see their, their fertility rates, which are shown in the, um, the solid line, compared with the rates of female survival, which declines with age on the dashed line. Um, and basically what we found was that the fertility rates decline in chimpanzees at about the same pace that they, they do in humans, uh, and that they're pretty close to zero here by the age of 50. Um, but the, the number of chimpanzees still surviving at that age was extremely low. So we concluded that females could be projected to go through menopause at around the age of 50, um, if they would live long enough. But this was going to be so rare that, um, that, that it, it wasn't particularly significant. Um, the comparative data for a human foraging population is on the right. And here you can see that fertility declines to zero when a significant proportion of women are still living. Um, and, and if you look at uh, demographic data from diverse human populations, including those that don't have life extending medical technologies, uh, women um, who survive to reproduce at all will um, on average outlive their fertility by about 10 years or more. Now there have certainly been a lot of anecdotal reports of um, chimpanzees that appear to be post-reproductive, sometimes even as early as their 30s in the wild and in captivity. Um, but we have to be cautious about what we infer from those events uh, because aging is associated with all sorts of changes that could compromise fertility but aren't equivalent to menopause. So you have various types of sterility that can result from infections and other things. You have an increasing rate of fetal loss, which would result in pregnancies that were never recognized by the observers. You also uh, have a tendency for females to be in declining health as they age, or perhaps declining energetic status, uh, so they aren't able to sustain pregnancy. Um, one research group has looked at this a bit more directly uh, by looking at uh, the number of follicles that are remaining in the ovaries of deceased individuals. So comparing sections of ovaries from chimpanzees with whole ovaries uh, from humans. And these results support the idea that chimpanzees could be expected to have menopause in their late 40s or early 50s. But again, the, this study was constrained by how few individuals actually reached that age. And of course, these individuals have, have died. So, it, um, Doctors, if they're, if they're looking at a woman who has uh, a, a fertility issue, they can distinguish menopause from other types 
of infertility by testing for two protein hormones that are involved in the regulation of the menstrual cycle. And we abbreviate these as LH and FSH. So the brain uses these hormones to communicate with the ovaries um, and to stimulate the growth of those egg cells. It causes those follicles to begin developing and producing the hormones estrogen and progesterone. Um, and those hormones go on to support conception and implantation. So once these follicles start really declining and there's relatively few available to be stimulated by LH and FSH, the ovaries aren't producing the estrogen uh, that is expected. And basically the brain keeps sending the LH and FSH signal. Um, it's like it, it never quite uh, adjusts to the fact that the ovaries aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. So if we look at a reproductively aged individual, what we see is brief spikes in LH and FSH at critical times of the menstrual cycle. But then as the follicle counts are getting lower and lower during perimenopause, LH and FSH levels steadily start increasing and they remain chronically elevated for years after menopause. So there is one study um, of captive chimpanzees that tried to look at these two hormones, but the results they had were, were somewhat confusing. Um, they show some age-related change, but they don't show the chronically elevated uh, levels of LH and FSH that you would expect to see. Uh, so they argued that you know, possibly menopause was occurring yeah, even earlier in chimpanzees in the late 30s or early 40s. Uh, and perhaps the mechanism isn't quite the same as it is in humans. So that brings us to the present study, um, where we're able to take advantage of the very large size of the Ngogo chimpanzee community to study uh, the fertility data and, and hormone data from uh, uh, fertility data for 185 individuals and hormone data from 63 females that were sampled about uh, 12 years apart. Um, we, first, we looked at uh, the demographic data for the aggregate community. Um, and what you see here in uh, red are the data for the Ngogo chimpanzees compared to the data from other chimpanzees. It's the same data that I, I showed you a few slides earlier in blue here. And what's notable on the left is that these fertility patterns with age are basically identical. There's no difference between the reproductive rates of Ngogo chimpanzees compared to other wild chimpanzees. What's really exceptional is that they have a large number of females who survive well past this age of last reproduction. So you can take the life tables that you use to create these figures and calculate a, uh, a post-reproductive uh, a proportion, essentially the proportion of life of adult life spent in post reproductive state. And, and the Ngogo chimpanzees, this this figure is much lower than it is for humans or for these toothed whales, but it's much, much higher than it is for any other wild non human primates that have been studied. So they're just spending about 20% of adult life in a post reproductive state. So then we looked at um, individuals to try to determine which individuals had experienced menopause or were putatively experienced menopause. Uh, and so we looked at the time since their last known birth and used a fairly conservative threshold that's based on, you know, if you take kind of the average birth interval, you add a couple standard deviations to allow for um, natural variation. Um, and, and this uh, comes out to 7.9 years. So we looked at any females who'd had at least that much time since their last birth, and we found 11 different females uh, who met that threshold of being post-reproductive. Um, so then the next step was to look at the urinary hormone data for these individuals. And these were sampled at, um, at two different points in time. Um, and this evidence shows a really striking difference between those uh, post-reproductive females and all the other non-pregnant, non-sexually uh, swollen females. So um, these changes are the changes that you would expect of menopause in humans. Uh, the post-reproductive females had low estrogen and progesterone and very, very high LH and FSH levels. Uh, and they're shown here in the black 
uh, the black dots compared to the blue dots for the reproductive females. So I'm just showing you FSH because I think the pattern is, is the most striking and because we had those FSH data from these two different points in time that included some, of, some different females. So for me, I deal with hormone data all the time and hormone data are notori notoriously really, really messy. Uh, and these are just the most striking, <laughs> this is the most striking signal I've, I've ever seen. It's very, very clear what's going on. Um, and we had not one, but many samples for these individuals. They're represented by one point, but they had consistently outlying levels of LH and FSH. So not only can we distinguish them from the other females by these uh, hormone levels, but we can actually uh, see the, the really stark age transition uh, beginning in the late 40s and accelerating at around age 50. Um, all told, we had nine females for which the hormonal data confirmed that they had experienced menopause. One of the other females wasn't able to be sampled. And then we had this one lady here um, who uh, was post-reproductive uh, according to the birth data. She had had a lot of years since her last birth, but her hormone levels weren't consistent with menopause. Um, and I really, I really love this data point because she's quite a bit younger than those other females. Um, and so she was likely to be sterile for, for some other reason. And, and she really helps us uh, uh, gain information about the, the age transition here. So um, as I said, for me, the answer to yes or no, do can chimpanzees go through menopause? Uh, maybe isn't that interesting because again, we expect that to be something that happens as uh, individuals get very old. Um, but I think these results are, are really important for a few reasons. Um, first, this is really the first direct evidence of a menopause uh, and of the the postmenopausal profile, not just for an individual, but for um, a cohort of individuals that are showing the same pattern. Um, and it shows us not only that um, chimpanzees share a common physiological response to menopause, and these are uh, the chimp data compared to human data here on the right, um, but it also gives us specific information about when menopause uh, occurs in this species. And so basically the hormonal data and the demographic data suggest that the timing of menopause is fundamentally the same in humans. Um, and it suggests that basically um, humans are exhibiting an ancestral biology of menopause. So we can talk about the evolution of menopause, but in fact, there's not much that has changed about menopause itself uh, at all. Um, what's really changed is the, the post-reproductive lifespan. Um, and, and this supports things that Kristen Hawkes and others have been saying uh, over the past, um, uh, the recent years, that, that the real evolutionary uh, innovation for humans is extended lifespan. That's what we need to explain. Um, more importantly, I think the big thing that this study can tell us is that the, the wide variation we see uh, in lifespans among wild chimpanzees um, includes the potential for a post-reproductive uh, lifespan, not just um, by a little, but in, in this case, by a decade or more. Um, and we know that variation is the key ingredient for natural selection to, ask, to act. Um, so while we, we don't know if these Ingogo chimpanzees are experiencing any sort of fitness benefits for, for being post-reproductive, um, and our data can't really tell us if uh, how post-reproductive lifespans would have evolved in humans, it does tell us that under the right conditions, the earliest hominin ancestors probably uh, would have occasionally experienced the right this decoupling of survival and reproduction, and, and that would have offered the opportunity for um, post-reproductive traits to be targeted by selection. So for me, the big question this leaves us is, you know, what is uh, what is so extraordinary about Ingogo? Uh, why, even compared to chimpanzees living in the same forest, do the Ingogo chimpanzees uh, have such favorable favorable conditions for survival? So my collaborators and I are are trying to figure that out now. We're we're asking the questions: What are 
the lifelong factors that contribute to longevity and health in this species. So these data were um, supported by lots of different uh, uh, funders, but the Leakey Foundation has been particularly critical for supporting long-term chimpanzee research. Um, and um, this data was all collected by the Ngogo Chimpanzee Project team. So many thanks to them. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. That was fascinating. Um, I, I just, there's so many questions I have now. Um, and it was great not only to hear the inside scoop on the research, but also to better understand its context. Uh, so this is definitely, as I said, sparked a number of questions for me and I'm sure our viewers as well. Um, I do wanna give a quick shout out to some of our live viewers. Uh, we have watching Mike, Karen, Sears, Pinky, Pete, Karen, Jennifer, Alana, uh, Panina, Chris, Ruben, Akiko, Luis, and Lisa. Uh, thank you all for watching. I know that there are other ones of you out there. If you let us know where you're joining from, I'll give you a, a shout out too. <laughs> um, so has menopause been found in other chimpanzee groups um, than the Ingogo chimpanzees? No. <laughs> so <laughs> the... Um... As I said, there have been, you know, occasional females that appear to be post-reproductive, but we don't, we don't really have the data to back up whether they've experienced menopause. Um, and, you know, as, as you said earlier in the, the presentation, I actually don't primarily work with the Ngogo chimpanzees. I work with Kanyawara chimpanzees who are in the same forest, they're the same population. They're about 20 kilometers away, which means that um, we have... Uh, females that grow up in Kanyawara and then breed at Ngogo. And there are Ngogo females that are born there and uh, breed in Kanyawara. Um, and we've got identical uh, types of data. We generated data on Kanyawara at the same time as we did for Ngogo. And um, we don't see any evidence of menopause, um, which maybe sounds like it's contradictory, but it's actually not uh, because the none of the chimpanzees that we were able to sample at Kanya were, were old enough. So they shouldn't have experienced menopause. Um, in other words, it's it's kind of, even with the lack of menopause, it's supporting the data that we see at Ngogo. So there's so much that goes into a study like this. You know, what, what, in, all, what in all goes in and what was your role? Um, well, yeah, this study had a, had a lot, um, you know, a critical factor for for a study like this is just having extensive long-term data. So you know, the Ngogo Chimpanzee Project began in 1995, and they've been following those chimpanzees ever since. And that's an extraordinary amount of effort, not only by the um, the the uh, American researchers, but by the Ugandan field teams. Uh, it's an extraordinary amount of uh, funding that they need over the the course of that time. Um, and in this case, uh, as you showed, we, we um, also took advantage of the ability to collect urine from these chimpanzees to assess for these hormones. And that's, uh, <laughs> that takes persistent effort as well. Um, and so not only did um, um, my lab work on, on these samples, we, we started um, in 2014, uh, we started a collaboration with Ngogo to study aging broadly in, in uh, these chimpanzees. And, and I, I would say at the time the the reproductive stuff wasn't really high on the agenda. We were, we were sort of interested in health factors, but uh, Kevin Langergraber kept saying, you know, hey, we've got all these post-reproductive females. <laughs> I was like, mm, I, don't know. I don't know if we'll be able to figure that out. So we, we didn't know if the assay would work. Um, and uh, uh, we're really excited that, that it did. And, and it turned out that um, Shali Gunter, who was a student at Ngogo uh, in, the, um, in 2006, uh, had had the foresight to do a little bit of this work um, with uh, post-reproductive females at the time. And, and even though they didn't have a big enough sample at the time, that data really added a lot to what we were able to show in, in this study. Well, collaboration, multidisciplinary research, and long-term field sites are all areas the Leakey Foundation celebrates and supports. Uh, since it is the giving season, I wanted to call on my Lunch Break Science friends to help make more of the Leakey Foundation's work, including Lunch Break Science, possible. Our sponsors will match your contributions, giving you the unique chance to quadruple your impact. 
your $25 contribution becomes a $100 impact and $250 transforms into a $1,000 impact. Together, we can support human origins research, protect primates, make careers more attainable, and share this fascinating research around the world. You can give through YouTube Giving, Facebook, or the link we've shared in the chat. Your generosity, no matter the amount, means so much to us. So, Melissa, you were on Lunch Break Science about two years ago talking about your work on aging. If you all didn't catch that episode, we've shared it in the chat and be sure to check it out to hear more about that work and Melissa's background. Melissa, can you give us a update on the aging work and what is new with you? Sure. <laughs> so, uh, we were able to get our, our um, funding from the National Institute on Aging uh, renewed and we're able to expand that research. So now uh, we're also collaborating with uh, the Gombe Chimpanzee Project, which is really exciting because they have, you know, 60 odd years of data. Um, and uh, we, we can now uh, understand how aging differs across different environments. And, and what we're trying to focus on right now is, is really understanding um, the lifelong um, factors, the experiences that might lead to differences in um, survival, but also differences in the health of older individuals. Um, we're focusing on things like disease, but also on social environments, on your status and your social relationships and, and how that shapes um, health across the life course. Um, I've also got some great students that, that are, have been funded by the Leakey Foundation recently. Um, uh, Stephanie Fox graduated in the uh, spring and she did some really cool research about um, at bonds among female chimpanzees. Um, and showing that, that the nature of their relationships and the nature of cooperation among females differs uh, a lot from, from that among males. It just operates differently. Um, Megan Cole is, is currently um, uh, writing up her PhD and she's looking at individual differences in behavior associated with um, their, um, their responsivity to stress um, mm -hmm. and how that affects their, their social behavior. So that's really exciting. And I've taken on an administrative job. I'm assistant vice president for, for research at UNM, which means that um, I get to work on programs that help support faculty and students across campus. Well, that is a, that is a lot of responsibility. And uh, I don't know how you juggle that with all of the research and collaborations, but um, you, you certainly make it look seamless. <laughs> That's nice to hear. <laughs> it doesn't feel that way. So now let's take some questions from our viewers. If you haven't gotten your questions in the chat yet, get them in the chat now. Uh, let's see here. We have uh, our first question comes from um, Alana. Uh, is Garbo still alive? Uh, interested in what age she was when she went through menopause? Oh, gosh. Um, I can't answer that question because I'm not one of the go -go observers. Um, I can't recall. Well, we will reach out and uh, we will um, uh, put the answer to that in, in the comments yeah. as soon as we know the answer. Um, not, not today, but in the future, so check back. Uh, okay, so our next question comes from Pete. Uh, extended human lifespan, surely that's down to having killed most of our predators and improvements in medicine. Um, not exactly. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> uh, certainly uh, we have achieved um, significant increases in lifespan in the industrialized world. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of data from um, small scale populations where they're, they don't have access to the kinds of medical improvements that you're talking about, um, where, you know, they're foraging every day to meet their, their caloric needs, where there's lots and lots of infectious disease. Um, where there are predators, um, you know, like jaguars in the, the, the South American rainforest. And those, those groups experience, you know, you may hear like um, they have short life expectancy. And that's the average lifespan. So what that really is, is that uh, large numbers of uh, young individuals die. A lot of infants, a lot of young children die in those populations because of infectious disease. Um, but the rates of survival for even those small scale populations, if people survive to adulthood, are really quite high. And so it's uh, it's the norm 
for women in any population you look at around the world um, to live well past the age of menopause. Um, okay, so our next, uh, that was a great question, Pete. Um, our next question comes from Sears. Uh, is it common in other primates such as orangutans and gorillas? Oh, that's a really good question. Thanks, Sears. It is a good question. I don't know the answer really. Um, there are there are some data on fertility that are available from wild gorillas um, that uh, show that that if if any post reproductive lifespan is experienced, it's really short. It's, it's um, as I, I suggested for other species, some individuals may live that long, but not very many, and and it's not very long. Um, and, and gorillas have a shorter lifespan in the wild than, than chimpanzees do. So uh, I don't know if that's part of it. The data on orangutans are, are, is harder to come by. So thus far, there's not any data that would suggest um, this kind of uh, long post-reproductive period, but they, they do live a really long time. So um, it's certainly possible that with more systematic study would be able to find that. They're just a lot harder to study than chimpanzees are. Okay, let's take our next question. Let's see here. Coming. Oh, okay. Um, at the population level, it's clear that extended lifespan is a benefit for humans due to transfer of knowledge. Is there any evidence of older female chimpanzees passing on knowledge and skills? Not really. Um, yeah, there, you know, um, if you look to bonobos, there's some interesting data to show that older females um, are often high ranking and they have a lot of influence, uh, particularly over the reproductive success of their sons. Um, and that's something you see in killer whales, for example. Um, but uh, in chimpanzees, that they don't have that kind of uh, effect on the, the, health, the success of their sons. Um, and usually their daughters aren't still in the community. Their daughters will leave and go somewhere else most of the time. Um, and we tend to see that those older female chimpanzees, they, they increase in status um, as, you know, among females, but they, they're kind of loners. They, they, they tend to avoid <laughs> other individuals. Um, so, I wouldn't bet on it, but we, we don't know for sure. Um, and it's it's kind of interesting if you look at, uh, for example, elephants. Elephants live a, a really long time and females have those really important influences uh, as leaders and as um, um, you know, carriers of, of unique knowledge about the ecology, um, but they don't have extended post-reproductive lifespans. And you see, you know, what you could call grandmother effects in elephants, where uh, having a, a, a living um, mother is beneficial to a female uh, elephant's uh, reproductive career. But it doesn't matter if she's reproducing or not. Like she, she's still reproducing and they're still having those kinds of effects. So it, it's uh, unclear what's happening here. Oh, I know, I'm like, I'm like, there's so many, like, so much research still left to be done and so many questions yet to be answered. Um, our next question comes from Karen. Here. Uh, how do you collect urine from wild chimpanzees? Which you which you do go over in your in your other talk. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to skip that here because I figured it was a it was a question that would come. Um, yeah, fortunately uh, chimpanzees spend um, you know, the majority of their day typically up in the trees, which is where the the fruit that they eat is. So um, we can just be underneath it. <laughs> um, and so what we would typically do is, is go out first thing in the morning, often before the chimpanzees even wake up. Um, and they're up in nests in the trees. Uh, and, and we stand underneath, wait for them to urinate. And they're, they're kind of just like people. They wake up in the morning and the first thing they do is go to the bathroom. Um, so if we mark where individual nests are, we can collect the urine. And as they go about their day, they they tend to um, they tend to urinate when they are done feeding and ready to leave a tree and go somewhere else. It's like you know before you take a road trip, you gotta. So um, you know it's not it's not easy, but we we've established a, a pattern and we can have pretty good success at collecting the urine. <laughs> it's um yeah it yeah and I love yeah, yeah definitely check out Melissa's other episodes that we shared in the chat because um you go into more detail on that one. <laughs> Um, and there's more we photos. We need too. a lot of urine, so it's not hard yeah. to collect. We need a very small amount. 
Okay, our next question comes from Panina. Uh, can we determine menopause in the fossil record? Oh. Oh gosh, I don't, I'm gonna say I don't think so, but <laughs> somebody might correct me on that. I, I can't, I can't think of a good, a good way, yeah. It'd be, it'd be really interesting though yeah. to find out. Yeah. yeah, I mean, even determining ages, uh, advanced ages in the fossil record, I think is extraordinarily complicated. Um, you know, if we don't know much about um, how old they get, that would be quite difficult. Okay, our next question comes from Pete. Uh, do females run out of eggs at menopause? Oh, uh, essentially, you could you could say that's what happens. It really, um, menopause starts to happen uh, well before you run out of eggs, um, but but really when the the uh, the number of of those primordial eggs is is too low, and a lot of them are duds, right? So you know it's a it's kind of a um, a misunderstanding that in a menstrual cycle you have one egg that develops and and goes through the process. In fact, there are big waves of these follicles that start developing. So those hormones that I talked about, FSH and LH, get get that whole process going. So whatever follicles are kind of ready to wake up, get stimulated, they start to produce um, estrogen. And the more estrogen they produce, the more likely uh, an egg will um, grow large enough uh, to be viable, to be able to be ovulated and fertilized. Um, and you need all of those. You need a lot of those, those follicles to be pumping out estrogen for this to really work. So if you've just got a few or if they're kind of, they're old and not so good, they, um, they won't produce enough uh, estrogen. So you, you could even have, you know, a few hundred, few thousand of those follicles left in the ovaries, but not be able to sustain ovulation. Okay, um, our last question uh, comes from our website uh, from Laura and um, she asks, uh, are there any other primates known to experience menopause? Um, humans, <laughs> yeah, so, so okay. again, you know, we can find um, some examples where people have pointed to uh, particularly macaques, Japanese and rhesus macaques um, that have outlived their fertility that appear to have experienced menopause, but, um, First, you know, it's not clear that they live significant chunks of time after that. Um, you know, so they, they sort of, those oldest individuals will outlive fertility, but, but not, not for long. Um, but also we just don't know in most cases that that actually was menopause as opposed to one of these other kind of health related or, or uh, other sterility factors that, that lead to lack of reproduction. Well, Melissa, this was a wonderful episode. Um, so thank you all for taking a break from your day and feeding your brain with the Leaky Foundation in 2023. We have heard the latest and greatest from incredible scientists. And it's kind of fun to actually, you know, see everyone and reflect on the amazing knowledge we've gained together. And, you know, thank you, Melissa, for joining us sharing your insights and wrapping up 2023. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great holiday, everyone. Well, we're excited to bring new discoveries, scientists, and more to you all in the new year. So until 2024, stay hungry for knowledge. Lunch Break Science is brought to you by the Leakey Foundation and made possible by the generous support of the Anne and Gordon Getty Foundation, Camilla and George Smith, and the Joan and Arnold Travis Education Fund, as well as viewers like you. Show your support of Lunch Break Science by subscribing to our channel, clicking on notifications, and giving us a thumbs up, or making a donation to help us create new content. Still craving science and can't wait for the next episode? You can feast on the Leaky Foundation's content library with past episodes, lectures, our podcast origin stories, and more. Thank you all for tuning in, and see you next time.